I want to welcome everyone today. Uh, again, this is Jeff Blockman at Define Health, and um, thanks for listening in to this uh, latest uh, version of the Insight Series webinar, Cancer Progress Revisited, Making Sense and Sense of IO Combos and Their Value. So we're very pleased today to not only have uh, two of our uh, important oncology team members uh, co-moderating, Joel Sandler, who's an associate principal, and James Lee, a senior consultant, uh, but also uh, two uh, uh, additional uh, participants uh, whose reputation precedes them, uh, Roger Longman, CEO of, of Real Endpoint, and Kapil Dingra, President of Capital Consulting. We hope you'll also uh, view the recently released Cancer Progress White Paper, uh, which pairs with this webinar and revisits many of the key themes that arose throughout the conference that we held uh, in this, past, this year, this past March. Um, and you can find that white paper at cancerprogressbydh.com. And of course, you can learn more about Defined Health and all our early strategic commercial development services uh, by giving us a call, sending an email, or visiting our website. It's all that work that really informs our ability to do these uh, webinar series. Uh, we hope to have some time at the end to field any questions in the closing minutes of the session. So please uh, send in those questions via the, the system. And if we don't have a chance to get to your question, uh, we will follow up with those over the next few days. Uh, we also anticipate the slides and an audio-visual version or recording of this webinar uh, will be available on the website within the next few days. So with that, I thank your attendance. Please enjoy this edition of Defined Health Insight Series webinars, and I'll turn it over now to Joel and to James. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and I just want to echo what Jeff had to say. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, on this lovely summer day if you live in the Northeast and, and for the rest of you, I hope you're having uh, good weather as well. We, um, as Jeff mentioned, we hold our annual cancer progress meeting uh, every, every spring uh, and this year was an exciting one and an interesting one. Uh, in addition, we've started, as Jeff alluded to, um, writing a companion piece to the meeting, uh, the, the white paper, which as Jeff said is available online. Um, the discussion today, which, which promises to be a really interesting one, I'm just going to walk through a couple of slides because uh, I want to uh, spend most of the time on the discussion. Uh, but the discussion today really zeroes in on a couple of points uh, that I think were front and center at the meeting and perhaps are top of mind for most people uh, in this space these days, which is uh, immuno-oncology combinations and the value um, or price associated with them. Uh, and these are really kind of two sides of the same coin. We have a, a lot of innovation happening and a lot of excitement around that. Uh, at the same time, we see huge price tags. We see IO as particularly the anti-PD-1 checkpoints uh, as uh, a breakthrough in themselves, but perhaps uh, much more saliently uh, as a platform upon which other therapeutic modalities can be layered uh, in order to increase the likelihood of patients achieving durable responses uh, across what have uh, up until now uh, been intractable tumor types. Um, and so that's, that's really the, the emphasis of a discussion today. So just a, a couple of uh, points I wanted to quickly make. Um, so IO or immuno-oncology and in particular uh, anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 checkpoints uh, have really kind of validated this century plus long endeavor uh, to find a modality or means to unleash the anti-tumor immune, immune response. Um, and while investors and analysts tend to be quite bullish, uh, if you look at the current trajectory of, of where revenues are already headed, uh, we see unprecedented growth uh, on top of an already large base in terms of revenues. And a lot of that, as you can see in the, um, in the, in the chart on the bottom right, is, is driven by these uh, checkpoint inhibitors in particular. As I said, though, you know, we're really talking about checkpoint inhibitors as perhaps the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of scientific 
and clinical rationale to believe that checkpoint inhibitors could be improved upon, perhaps greatly improved upon, with the addition of additional therapeutic modalities. Uh, and so that opens the door not only for those in big pharma that are developing these first mover modalities, but um, additional therapeutics that could potentially uh, be added on. And indeed, we see this um, huge amount of activity in the pipeline, uh, and as I already mentioned, reflected in, uh, in the current and projected revenues for, for checkpoint inhibitors, which reflects not only uh, in th those, those uh, products as monotherapies, but in, in combination regimens as well. Um, and just to put a finer point on it, if, for anyone who's read uh, the, the recent report that came out of Evaluate Pharma, um, you can see that, you know, in terms of both sales growth uh, and market share, oncology is really vaulted up to the top right, uh, and, and that's in no small part fueled by these checkpoint inhibitors. Um, now, all that said, there is uh, a huge amount of activity, both in terms of clinical trials for monotherapy and combination approaches across many different therapeutic areas, many different tumor types. Um, but all of this is, uh, you know, kind of in, in the backdrop of a end user that uh, has to pay for it or um, ha has to in some way be, uh, be, be charged with subsidizing this innovation. Uh, and so, you know, the question is really, is this coming to a head? And more importantly, what are the implications of that? Uh, as we spoke to in, in the white paper, um, and, and, you know, uh, has been kind of increasingly present in press releases and, and media, uh, payers are, to some extent, um, have, have, have their hands tied in, in the case of oncology just given that it's a life-threatening disease, it's an emotional one, it's widespread. Um, and so part of the answer to that is payers shifting the risk and the costs to the end user, to the providers, uh, and at the, same, at the same time who are being armed with different tools both to provide them with leverage for, for pushback against what they see as a, an egregious price tag, or certainly at least a high price tag, uh, as well as information uh, that, ev you know, even in the absence of head-to-head -head clinical trials for multiple PD-1s, uh, may perhaps provide some, um, some source uh, to, to inform their decision-making, both based on, on efficacy uh, and, and other clinical properties, but also, also the price uh, of, of, these, of these drugs. Pharma in, in kind is, is responding um, with various value-based contracting approaches. Um, you know, many would say kicking the tires or kind of testing the waters. Uh, I think an open question is whether it pays or will pay strategically to be proactive in this regard. There are certainly uh, some companies out there that are thinking uh, either about pricing uh, their their products, which may be clinically undifferentiated from what's already out there, either at a discount or um, in the context of some sort of uh, innovative pricing schemes, and, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that in the next hour. So uh, some questions that I had, or that we had from Define Health, uh, are presented here. Uh, I'm not going to go go through them, uh, but I think this is a good place to start. We have um, read through on any questions coming in from our virtual audience, so anything that you think is going to be of interest and salient to this, this discussion around the interface between innovation and price, 
uh, please send it along and, and we'll do our best to get to it. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague James to start us off. And the format today is really uh, an open dialogue um, with two uh, very esteemed panelists who should help uh, get to the bottom of some of these questions, if not answers. Okay. Thank you very much, Joel. So yeah, I just wanted to start framing, you know, our initial discussion, and, and you know, really the best way to do that is to talk about those immuno oncology combinations, and and you know, in in the post PD one L one world, you know, there's a lot of different types of combinations uh, using that as a backbone, and it's very interesting to you know kind of think about how the landscape's going to be changing, um, you know, initially. Uh, you can easily use melanoma as an example as, as the prototype of what could happen in the future. So, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, I, I think it will be good to maybe get Kapil, um, his opinion on, on maybe what you think are some emerging themes in the competitive landscape uh, in, in positioning in the post-PD1 world. Okay. Uh, thank you. So let me just lay out a couple of theses here. The, it's obvious that we are in this world of combination immuno checkpoint therapies. So what I want to do is give you a little bit of perspective on the checkpoint combination, but then really lay out a couple of areas that I think are much more interesting actually. This doesn't mean that the checkpoint combination way will not continue. It is going to continue. It's here upon us. But let me just step back for a second and sort of remind the audience of the history. Uh, where we are with immuno-oncology today is pretty close to where we were with chemotherapy, let's say in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, the first chemotherapy uh, had just become uh, shown some sort of success. Uh, we had seen some dramatic efficacy in a couple of rare tumor types such as Hodgkin's disease and childhood acute leukemia. And everyone thought the cure for cancer was just another three or four chemotherapy drugs away. If we could just combine everything with everything, we would just cure cancer. And so we spent the next 40 years testing that out. And of course, you all know the reality. We made some important progress, but also there's a finite limit to that progress. In some ways, the current mad rush towards immune-oncology combos is very reminiscent of the same story. There's no question PD-1 has been an extraordinary success, but it has been an extraordinary success for a subset of patients with various cancers. More importantly, we need to be humble enough to recognize that not one person predicted PD-1 will work as well as it did, because if you look at the preclinical data with PD-1 antibodies, they are actually not that much better than most of the other immunotherapy drugs that came before it and failed. Or, or work but didn't work quite as well. So I think if I add all of that, it makes sense for us to focus on PD-1 as a potential backbone for a variety of tumor types. It makes sense for us to do combinations, but what is solely lacking is the rationale for a variety of combinations. So we're going through this mad rush of two by two and we're starting to see some three by three combinations come through. So that will play out. So, but let me just sort of say, for stage setting stage, throw out a couple of other things here and then we open it up. The one area that excites me beyond the checkpoint combination approaches is actually the use of approaches that don't require us to have a prior knowledge of relevant antigens. So I'm talking specifically of antigen agnostic approaches. A lot of those are in development. Many, many of those are intratumoral approaches such as uh, oncolytic viruses, immunomodulator injected locally, because I believe at the end of the day, we are not smart enough to know what are all the relevant antigens, and we are not smart enough to know what are the relevant suppressor factors in any given patient. So it makes sense to uh, do a lot more intratumoral type of approaches uh, without having a prior knowledge of an antigen. Uh, another area I'd like to highlight is uh, that uh, as we go along this process, we have to become a little bit smarter at it and increasingly the use of biomarkers and companion diagnostics in patients treated with immunotherapies will play a role. And we have, that's only if we're going to get smart about what are the best combinations to test 
instead of the blind two by two combination that we are doing today. So that's a little bit longer introduction for sage setting, but uh, uh, perhaps Roger would like to comment as well. Sure, so um, may, maybe just to help move things along, Ro Roger, um, you know, there, there's a ton of innovation out there. Um, and I agree with Kapil, it's, it's probably a bit short-sighted to focus on combinations. Uh, but at the same time, from our vantage point, it seems like PD-1s as a potential backbone and with the rationale of the tumor immunity cycle uh, and the fact that PD-1s themselves uh, are relatively well tolerated and, you know, I think, I think physicians are learning how to deal with the sequelae. Um, at least in the near term, there's a lot of innovation springing up, a lot of investors getting excited, a lot of new biotechs coming over uh, the transom almost on a weekly, if not daily basis for at least the better part of 2016. Um, so we're talking about incrementally improved uh, efficacy, benefit to patients. Uh, everyone expects a return on their investment, and certainly risk-taking biotechs and their investors expect a return. Um, how, how does all this get, get funded in, in the end, and, and are there opportunities uh, for, for, for companies that are approaching the, the finish line or commercialization um, that, that might help them differentiate themselves, not just clinically, uh, but also from a value standpoint? Um, it's a darn good question, James. Um, but if I could step back for a second, um, the entire premise of, of, of what you're saying, uh, and indeed of your slides, uh, is that somehow cancer is different from other therapeutic categories, from the main therapeutic categories, from immunology or from hepatitis C or uh, cardiovascular. And um, and the question really for me is how long that's going to be sustainable. So it's worth it, I think, to step back and say why is, uh, uh, from a payer point of view, from an economic point of view, why is cancer different? Um, and part of it is uh, tradition or perhaps emotion. Um, in payers have historically been unwilling to interfere in, uh, in the physician's therapeutic decisions in cancer. And over the last five years, they have been extremely willing to interfere in their decisions about other uh, serious diseases um, and point them to specific drugs. Um, a second key point about uh, cancer is that structurally it's different from a payer's point of view. Uh, uh, oncology is one of half a dozen protected classes in Medicare. And um, I don't know if most oncology patients are 65 and over, but certainly a significant number of them. And a protected class means that Medicare plans uh, aren't able to restrict um, uh, the number of drugs, the number of oncologics, that can be prescribed. And as soon as you can't do that, then it's very difficult for plans to start um, uh, making deals with particular uh, companies to prefer their drug. Second big uh, structural issue, uh, I think, is, is how reimbursement is determined. It's largely determined based on the compendia. Um, uh, and if you can get your drug into one of the compendia, Certainly, NCCN is probably the best, but if you can get them into one, generally you can get a payer to pay for them. Um, and then a third structural issue, uh, certainly a PD-1 fit into this, is that these, uh, these drugs are, are Part B or physician-provided drugs. And uh, Part B as in boy drugs are much more difficult to control by a payer than Part D or pharmacy benefit drugs. And then finally, there's the financial issues. Um, 
these drugs are a big part of an oncologist's income, and the more expensive the drug, the better for the provider. Um, and I think that's only been increasing as, uh, as health systems um, uh, have been acquiring oncology practices and, and raising prices. So these health systems are increasingly um, interested in, in higher priced uh, drugs. So with all of that, you know, it would look like these, um, uh, uh, like the, the notion of a protected class is going to continue on for, uh, you know, a number of years. Where I think this is going to change um, is when the physicians and or the systems themselves start becoming responsible in one way or the other for the cost. And indeed, most payers have continued to let physicians make the prescribing choices, but they are trying to use other levers to influence them, um, most particularly uh, uh, clinical pathways, which is sort of the oncology version of a formulary. And you see payers like Anthem with its AIM unit or Aetna uh, using clinical pathways to define um, for, uh, for physicians in their network particular specific uh, therapies to use uh, that are vetted by, some, by, by the equivalent of a P&T committee. But you're also seeing things like um, gain share programs um, uh, uh, from groups like United Healthcare, uh, in which the physician isn't penalized for using more expensive drugs um, necessarily, but he is incentivized because he can actually make some more money if indeed um, certain quality and cost measures uh, change. So you've got bonus for actually saving money. That's going to eventually start to, uh, to change incentives. Yeah. And then I think one final thing, and you brought this up already uh, in your presentation, is the patient side of things. Um, the, the real change here is, is that we've got uh, uh, patients more and more responsible for the cost of their own care. And at some point, um, they are going to, well, they have already started to make different decisions um, about their care, either delaying care or skipping doses. Um, uh, uh, and I assume that if manufacturers are uh, going to um, begin to offer uh, uh, lower price products, um, patients may start to have uh, uh, a role in deciding which drugs get used. Well, thank you very much. I, yeah, that, that was a great um, introduction um, from your side of coin. And I think uh, now I'm trying to bring it all together a little bit of, you know, both of you, Roger and, and Kapil's, um, you know, opening statements here. So the way I see it is the future of oncology is not going to be as simple as, you know, you know oncologists uh, be able to prescribe what they want with, you know, being this sanctuary, uh, therapeutic area, as you, as you were alluding to, but being a little more complicated in how the payers will be able to reimburse or willing to reimburse uh, the future of oncology if, if it is common, a combination world that we're suggesting. So one, one you know, case uh, that I like to bring up, I mean, is melanoma. I think that that's something that could come to head in the next year or so when when we get more combinations getting approved uh, with PD-1 um, for frontline usage. So there obviously is already an approval with Ipinevo, but you know, with the additional approvals, how, how, how are we going to be able to deal with um, you know, the, the increased cost of potentially running patients through multiple lines of combination therapies for who knows how many years? Um, and, and before they, you know, go to a clinical trial or even go to a monotherapy sort of uh, generic chemotherapy kind of kind of a, a therapeutic. So I think that that is something that I think we should 
kind of talk about a little bit. Maybe we can bring this back over to uh, Kapil and maybe you can give your thoughts on that. Yeah, so far from me to be a reimbursement expert, but I do want to pick <laughs> up on your question uh, in the context of what Roger said. I think Roger made a very fundamental observation. Uh, uh, and the question is not just philosophical, but also practical and ties into your question. When does cancer actually start getting treated as other therapeutic areas? And that's a very interesting question because for, for the investments where the biotech and pharma make in innovation, it's not too early for us to start thinking about that because I, I don't think it's as far away as many in the business have thought. So it is a relevant question. So, so let's just pause for a minute and ask why is cancer so different and how long can it stay different? So it's obvious and I don't mean to sound graphic, but the reality is there are very few diseases that bring the absolute certainty of death. Uh, and there are very few diseases where you see that sort of coming closer and closer every single day and in a person who is otherwise relatively healthy, in that most other organ systems are well-functioning, brain is intact, heart is intact, and that's what has led to cancer being sort of cordoned off from a reimbursement perspective. But there's a second aspect of it. If you look at most of the common cancer, there weren't really multiple lines of therapies that were effective, so there wasn't really an option for a physician or, or the patient to try something else that's quote-unquote cheaper. Because uh, when, when you have this sort of certainty of fatality, every three months extra, extra made a difference. Now, how does that change? It, and I think immune oncology will go a long way in changing cancer to start looking like other therapeutic areas. And what I mean by that is it's increasingly clear from all the data that's emerging that in the near to intermediate term, uh, all of this immune oncology, the 900 combination trials going on, by and large will not cure uh, too many patients with metastatic disease. But what is also clear is that we will start to convert an increasing proportion of patients to chronic diseases. And when we start converting them to a, a, a variety of chronic diseases, let's say hypothetically cancer is 500 to 1,000 different diseases, in each of those so, or in some subsets of those, there may be one combination relevant, another one, another combination. And let's say by over the next 10 years, we will likely evolve to multiple lines of uh, uh, effective therapies for patients with cancer and melanoma is the leading edge of that. So I, I think in the near term, we don't change the paradigm in that the payers are still willing in part because the efficacy of this new class of drugs is, is much better. But that efficacy hurdle is going to keep going higher and higher for the payers to keep paying and for patients to keep uh, be willing to put up with the financial toxicity of the treatment. Now, how, do, how does it get paid in this uh, less than the next 10 year type of time frame or 10 to 15 year time frame before uh, cancer is truly such a chronic disease that it starts getting treated as other therapeutic area is a much more interesting question. I think Roger is much more of an expert on the various payment models, whether they are based on capitation or value-based pricing, et cetera, and perhaps I should turn it over to him and have him comment on it. Um, I'm happy to comment on it, Kapil, um, but, uh, but I'm not exactly sure uh, uh, which specific aspect to comment on. One of the, the, the key points here is, is that um, when we're talking about other uh, kinds of contracting, it's really just not worth it yet in cancer. So um, in Europe, certainly, we've seen um, uh, value-based contracting uh, happen. Um, but that's because Europeans are willing to uh, restrict the use of chemo, the, 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 the use of oncologics. They're not really doing that yet here, which is why you have virtually no oncology-specific uh, value-based agreements. I saw your slide in which uh, you said Avalier had you know, some percentage were a small percentage uh, of the total value-based deals were oncology. I, I, that may be true. Uh, uh, that there are some, I, uh, I can't imagine that they're particularly important. Um, the, uh, the key is, is that if you, can't, uh, if you can't force competition, there's no reason to do any kind of contracting, value-based or rebate-driven. Um, where I think this is going to change, however, is specifically with the PD-1s. Um, and 
the the challenge for the PD1s right now is not simply to show incremental benefit over the competitors, um, but in effect to show uh, data where the competitors are not. Um, the question is, particularly from the patient's point of view, are you going to be willing to pay these high costs for drugs which show data in a specific indication when it is likely that each of these drugs is pretty much a biosimilar of the other. Now, I, I realize that's, that sounds pejorative, um, uh, but there are now lots of oncologists who are uh, seeing uh, the, the, these PD-1s as sort of Coke, Pepsi, and Dr. Pepper. And the number four, number five PD-1 that comes in at a significant discount, and I don't mean a discount in terms of uh, a rebate, I mean a discount in terms of the WAC price, could have a significant advantage in terms of patients because patients, the, 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 the price that they pay um, is often based on the WAC price, the list price of the drug. The lower that list price, the lower the patient portion of the, of the drug, uh, of the drug cost. And the more that a patient sees that uh, he can save money um, uh, by using a, an alternative drug, uh, the more he is going to be interested in, in, in that choice. Um, and you've got three uh, PD-1s or PDL-1s, if, if you uh, four actually, if you add to centric and sort of at the $13,000 a month level, you know, if you had a, a, a new PD-1 that comes out at a 30%, 40% discount to those, my bet is that some patients are going to uh, say uh, saving that 4000 bucks a month is definitely worth it to me, even if that uh, drug does not have data uh, that the uh, uh, in in the indi in, in maybe my specific indication that uh, the competitors do. I'll stop there. Yeah. So let me just add a little bit uh, additional perspective on that, James. So I I agree with almost everything Roger has said actually. Uh, but I want to add uh, an additional component to this dimension. So there are 22 PD-1s and PDL-1s in development. So broadly speaking, they're similar. Uh, even if we hypothesize, let's say PDL-1s are different because just the target is different and there are some small differences in safety and efficacy, you're still left with somewhere around 12, 15, 18 PD-1s, uh, uh, three of which are on the market and more coming through. So in addition to the payers and physicians and patients, one other key player in this equation, I believe, is going to be the FDA and the regulators. Some of the FDA leaders have been on record as late as six or 12 months ago saying, why is the industry developing so many PD-1s? Yet at the same time, some of those same regulators and companies are talking to them are insisting that if you're developing and doing a clinical trial, the control arm should have a PD-1 that's approved for that indication. So one can play it both ways. You could argue that innovation, uh, it promotes innovation and proper studies of drugs if actually each PD-1 is forced to be tested in each tumor type, but that goes exactly what the FTL leaders are arguing against themselves, that why are you spending billions of dollars in 10th in class PD-1? So we are seeing 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th in class PD-1s all trying to find a niche market, get to market. So the question is, what body of data is needed for that PD-1 to be used broadly across multiple tumor types? And it's a space to watch because I, I believe the leaders in the field will continue to try to uh, uh, posit that their PD-1 is different. And I think we have seen the opening salvos of that with the biomarker discussion and what has happened with Optivo and Ketruda and uh, the oncology community is going to get split. So I think it, it, it is crucial for the sake of the field and to con uh, continue fostering innovation that we sort it out. What is the totality of data needed to say yes 
fundamentally all these PD ones are same. So therefore, with even though we don't call them biosimilar, effectively PD one gets commoditized. Let's say over the next three, four, five, seven years, because commoditizing PD one is crucial to sustaining innovation. Because otherwise, we let everybody who can get a PD one approved for a niche indication take their 10,000 or 15,000 patients and keep the price at 13,000. So it, it is an interesting uh, a, a book being written and we'll see what the next chapter brings. Yeah, so I want to I want to steer the conversation back to, to combinations and, and I think this is all good segue. Do you have PD-1 becoming a commodity and we're kind of in the thick of that uh, chapter in this story. Uh, the next chapter, or, well, the chapter that is playing out now, but that, uh, in terms of development but, and, and partnering, but that will ultimately play out uh, in the clinic and commercially is that of PD-1s as a platform or as a backbone uh, for, for various combination regimens. Um, we've seen kind of in the beginning of this, uh, some pre-competitive partnerships uh, where money may or may not be changing hands between the likes of Merck and BMS and various uh, potential combination partners. Um, is that in a world where PD-1s do become increasingly commoditized, do those types of deals continue to happen? Are they even relevant? Uh, and I guess ultimately the bigger question is what are the implications for the development stage biotechs that are looking to uh, play a role in this evolving landscape. And I guess I can, uh, I can, I can, start, I can start with Kapil, but um, Roger, I think there is an inherently a value question in there, so I, I would like for you to speak to this as well. Sure. Okay, so, so let me start. So, so I think it, it's an interest. We have, it, the pendulum has been switched in the last two years. Uh, two years ago, when you talked to every biotech, they were practically begging one of the two leaders to give them a PD-1, especially one of them was more difficult than the other. And uh, my, my advice to all is uh, you actually have a lot more power than you think. Because in, in my view, if PD-1 is going to be commoditized, the real, real power, if you will, lies in the hand of the innovator, which is the biotech, which has a new drug that that can be combined. So at this point, but as usual, science is lagging behind in terms of rationale for the various combos. So we are in this mad rush world where we have the 800 combos going. My 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 concern is that that will most of these combos will fail. Some of those will be horribly toxic. Some of those will work for subsets of cancer. We don't have any real way of uh, prioritizing them. What makes sense to do versus what make, doesn't make sense to do. So the key here is for each of the biotechs that's looking to combine in this commoditized world, you can get the right partnership and right value for your assets if you actually do your homework in terms of generating the rationale and trying to define here is the immune me escape mechanism from a PD-1 for this subset of tumors, and therefore my drug is uniquely situated to be combined with PD-1 for this subset. It will not be a monolithic world where we are just going to uh, take to, to follow from my analogy of combination chemotherapy before. It's not going to be a world where you can take any combination combined with PD-1 for all of the approved indications of PD-1. So I'll stop there. I think appeal is exactly right. I 100% I, uh, I, I, I agree. The, the real key issue for the innovators in this world who uh, are, are looking to combine with PD-1 is to really figure out where their drugs uh, work uh, with a PD-1 background, with a PD-1 backbone, but not to focus on a specific PD-1. Um, uh, that way is, I think, uh, uh, Demand, uh, is, is, uh, completely antithetical to the way the the, the economics of healthcare is moving. Um, uh, it, there is no, ed, uh, I suppose there could be a financial advantage ultimately if one of the PD-1 players is willing to pay, but uh, other than that, I, I strongly see that um, uh, the the way forward is to assume that multiple PD-1s are going to be able to work with your with with the combination therapy and to 
um, and to build your strategy uh, on that uh, on that assumption. There's, um, uh, I'll just stop there. <laughs> I completely agree with you, Kapil. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, thinking about the combinations themselves, I think that that's those are great points. But now I want to bring it back to the payer perspective. I mean, yeah, you know, right now that is the case. You know, everything will get approved uh, for reimbursement if if it gets approved. But I mean, what happens when when every com every type of therapeutic is going to be a combination? I mean, will the system break at that point? Well, the answer is that the system probably won't break. It may slow down, um, and um, at you know, de depending on the health system that we have at the time, um, uh, we're going to see people forced to make some pretty tough choices. Um, if, for example, the uh, uh, Better Care Act passes. Um, we're going to see uh, certainly the Medicaid market um, substantially shrink. We're going to probably see significant um, uh, restrictions in that uh, on the oncology side of Medicaid. Uh, certainly, the exchanges. Uh, anybody who's who's working on the exchanges uh, again under uh, the Better Health Care Act uh, or the Better Care Act um, uh, are going to. Um, be far more restrictive. Uh, they have to be, um, uh, and they will be allowed to be. Um, so, will the hit health system break? No, I don't think it will, because I think people will figure out ways of com of, uh, of uh, economizing before that happens. Right, and, and that makes perfect sense. Um, so let, let's just think about it this way. I mean, you did mention earlier that the future could be clinical pathways if this becomes more of a chronic um, ailment that we can make make uh, oncology into that. Um, and and I, again, I'm going to bring up the melanoma melanoma situation where you know we have all these new therapeutic combinations coming into play. H how do you think they can? You know, without clinical data, I mean, everyone's gonna, you know, say like my my combination uh, proof for you know checkpoint naive is is the best combination. How will the oncologists be able to justify their decisions of which combination to go for first and and which one second, which one third, um, without you know clinical paths really being the guidance at this point? I mean, it's something that the the payers are not really enforcing as much. In oncology, let me just take that. I think uh, it's uh, uh, if you think in vacuum, yes, that's an issue. The reality is, if we become so smart that there are half a dozen or a dozen combinations that are looking fantastic across multiple tumor types, at that point, I have to assume reasonably that we're going to start curing a few people as well, right? So, so I don't worry so much about it. I, in a way. Uh, Part of uh, my central thesis is uh, I think PD-1 working for 20% of uh, a given tumor type and then doing the same thing in 15 other tumor types, that's likely to be an exception. That's not the rule. So part of the way combinations will evolve is that uh, any given combination partner for PD-1 will work for a subset of patients, and that's how oncology has always evolved. You take patients who are uh, received a drug and then they become resistant to that drug, and you demonstrate that a new drug adds something to the old drug in that resistance setting. So we are just at the very, very beginning stages of segmenting, if you will, the PD-1 progressor and PD-1 non-responder populations. And yes, a variety of drugs will work in those patient populations, but we are not close at this point to generating four lines of doublets of immuno-oncology for every solid tumor patient. We're just not there. So I think uh, they, 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 we, are, we have to take the time dimension into account as well. It's not just a sheer number of drugs. If you add the time dimension and you take the supposition PD-1 gets commoditized, yes, uh, the, uh, uh, the cost of cancer drugs and the combination issue, but perhaps not as overwhelming as it looks 
if you just say, oh, there are 800 combination trials going on and you will have this flood of combinations that are working. The fast fact is most of the combinations, in fact, are not really doing much more than what PD-1 alone does. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to come back to uh, something Rod, Roger said earlier, which, which I, and, and Roger, you can tell me if I'm, I'm misparaphrasing you, but that in the U.S. there's, there's pretty much a lack of incentive for innovative uh, contracting. Um, in a world where PD-1s do become, e even in a world where PD-1s become increasingly commoditized, um, I guess one question is, is there still a cap placed, uh, and it may not be a real cap, it may be just kind of a fuzzy cap, on the regimen price uh, for a combination? So PD-1 occupies, you know, I think you said 13K a month. Uh, maybe it goes down a little bit if there if there are some latecomers who come in with a, a discount. Uh, on top of that, uh, there's going to be potentially a combination agent that itself is going to be priced presumably at a premium for the company uh, that, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. on the risk of developing it. Um, is there is there a cap there? And I guess the the follow up question of that is. Are there opportunities for companies that can differentiate their combination regimen, not only on clinical values, but uh, on, on pricing strategy? Um, so I don't think that there is a cap, um, because I don't think the U.S. works on that basis. Um, but clearly, um, there is a, 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 a potential for a competitor with a really neat combination therapy to uh, do interesting pricing. Um, it's not necessarily going to be a contracting strategy per se, although that could become part of it. It's really, can I um, start doing a new kind of sort of DTC strategy, which is to say this combination strategy works really well and um, because you can use any PD-1 with it, uh, or because, uh, uh, yeah, and you can use a, a cheaper PD-1 with it. In fact, you can, uh, you can get this combination therapy for a lot less uh, money than, uh, um, than the competitors. That's going to be a powerful message. I, I don't think you can underestimate just how important today that coinsurance copay is to um, uh, uh, to patients. We're already seeing declines in uh, in the use of chemotherapeutics uh, uh, based on um, uh, the cost. We've seen it in every other category. Um, and remember, these are you know largely older patients, and those patients are uh, on fixed incomes or thinking about what kind of resources they want to leave to their families. Uh, so there is a real uh, opportunity uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, combination players to, uh, uh, to start playing <laughs> uh, the economic card. Uh, and I think Kapil's point about um, uh, focusing on uh, the PD-1 backbone without thinking about the specific PD-1 is crucial here. So, yeah, I, I think that makes uh, a lot of sense there too. And, and but I think I still have an issue though with with, with a small biopharma that's looking to combine with that PD-1 backbone. Is if you're Using that argument that commoditization will occur, or there may be a lower price PD-1 or PD-L1 in the future, um, if you run a trial, you know, just company X uh, runs a trial in combination or in collaboration with a pharma that doesn't happen to be one of those companies that feel that it's going to be commoditized and is pricing it at a premium, or is there an ability to you know, be able to attach yourself later on to one that is priced um, at a discount 
and, and, and how will that really play out in the future? I mean, I, it, it seems like a big, um, there's going to be a lot of protests potentially with the big pharma players that are pricing at a premium. And, you know, what do you, what do you think is going to actually happen there? Well, you know, James, I'm, my sense is, so let me, let's back up for a second. Um, if you wanted to do a combination in, in, uh, in, in a single cardiovascular drug, you know, think about Entresto, which is, you know, two uh, different uh, drugs put into one pill. That's, that is a whole development program in and of itself. But the, the uh, oncology combinations you're talking about don't, don't have to be packaged together. Now, yes, they do have to be trialed together or theoretically, although Again, that's simply the approval, and 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 approvals are not what uh, are not the basis of much of oncology usage. You know, physicians can pretty much do what they like, and as I pointed out earlier, um, drugs are paid for not on the basis of an approved indication, but whether they have an indication that has some evidence with uh, and and is listed in the compendium. So I think that. Some of the challenges that you're thinking about, um, while certainly important, are not as relevant in the oncology space as uh, as uh, as they would be in some other therapeutic category. So I, I'd like to put a counterpoint to that. Um, so. You know, it was announced, uh, I guess, a few months ago that Insight would have a partnership with BMS in combination of Epicatastat with Opdivo. However, as we all know, Epicatastat is already in phase three trial with um, Keytruda with Merck, uh, but that's a collaborative deal. So if that were really going to be the case, are you expecting, that, I mean, I don't see the advantage of, of partnering with Opdivo. Uh, with BMS at this point, if you're already going to um, look for an approval with uh, Merck's PD-1. So, I mean, can you well, I, I, expand I, I on that a little bit? Yeah, I could see a couple of advantages. One is that your drug works with two different PD-1s. There, therefore, it's probably likely to work with other PD-1s. And therefore, you have uh, a broader set of opportunities to have your drug prescribed with uh, a variety of uh, manufacturers' PD-1s. That makes sense to me. Also, I don't know what the economics of those partnerships were, but, you know, theoretically, if Insight can get paid by one or two other companies, all the better. So, so James, let me just add to that a little bit. I, I agree with Roger's point. So I think the Insight situation is a little bit different. Most small biotechs don't find themselves in that situation. So Insight, if move the clock back 12, 18, 24 months, the debate is not settled yet. We are not exactly to the point where all PD-1s are being used interchangeably. And I think the data over the last 12 months have sort of shown that. The real issue for the kind of biotechs you're describing looking for partnership is going forward, where do you anticipate the landscape to be? And my message to them would be very simple. You can talk to the, 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 uh, the lead three companies and say, look, I don't really need you actually because PD-1 is approved standard of care for 15 different tumor types. Whichever tumor type I'm going for, I can get PD-1 reimbursed as standard of care. But by the way, if you want me to become your partner, then you got to put something more on the table, including free PD-1 and whatever else you do. And, and this is what I was talking earlier. The leverage is on increasingly on the size of the small smaller biotech and not one of the PD-1 companies. And I see several questions have come up. What do the leaders in the field do? The leaders have to really pay attention to the innovators. And my, because a small biotech doesn't know what the final market share of various PD-1s is. So in some ways, the best thing they can do is to let PD-1 be used as quote unquote standard of care, whichever tumor type they're going for, whatever the investigator site uses. Uh, and I made the point earlier, we have to make sure the regulators are on board along the way. So there's no last minute wrinkle, but those things are relatively easily sorted out in, in pre-discussions with the FDA to make sure that's acceptable as long as PD-1 is being used as a quote-unquote standard of care. Fascinating. So we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour, but just to put a you know final point on that uh, and, and kick it back to Roger, 
Um, if you're BMS or Merck or AZ, um, it sounds like efforts to create barriers uh, and, uh, and, and differentiate maybe less so on the clinical side apart from being first to combination with some unique uh, innovative combination uh, and more around uh, being savvy on the commercial side and that includes pricing and reimbursement. Uh, Roger, any, any closing thoughts on that? Um, yeah, uh, I, I guess I, I think I agree with your point. I think that um, that cancer is uh, is indeed a clinically driven uh, opportunity, but I think that it is now. Uh, I think that that most uh, oncology companies are too focused on that, and that they have lost sight of the fact that oncology is. A, is for all its differences um, uh, part of the healthcare system, and will uh, uh, and will be facing the same kinds of challenges that all other categories are 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 facing, um, and that therefore the commercial strategy uh, becomes almost as important as the clinical strategy, maybe as important. So. Uh, Joel, I take your point, and I, I, I would say that if, if I were uh, a drug developer today, I would think of myself more as a marketer, or as much as a marketer, as I would a, uh, a clinician uh, scientist. Okay. Kapil, one, one minute left. You got the last word. No, I, th I just want to thank everybody uh, for listening in and for you guys to organize it. And thank you to Roger as well. I learned a lot also. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Yes, indeed. So, thank you both. Yep. Jeff, uh, I'll, I'll let you close it out. Thank you, everyone. Well, we, we still have a good number of attendees, uh, but we, we appreciate everyone uh, staying in on this uh, nice summer day, uh, at least on the East Coast, as Joel said. And... There are a number of questions. We try to address those kind of in the course of the discussion, um, but if there are any uh, that remain unanswered, we will follow up uh, subsequently. And again, the, uh, the website, the slides, the audio recording uh, will be available within the next few days. So again, I want to thank in particular both Roger and Kapil for, for joining us today and, and James and Joel for a great moderation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.